Gora Bala, PhD, is a globally experienced thinker doer. He is known as a presentainer. Right? He delivers inside packed experiences and he inspires and motivates day, next day executive action. So he's about immediate results in the fields of leadership, customer first thinking, and innovation. Please give a warm hand, page 10, Gaurav Bala. Thank you. How can you not be energized after listening to all the good people this morning? So I have to sprint forward. Um, good afternoon, everybody. And uh, I'm going to talk to you about a topic that is very, very important. So before I begin, a quick show of hands. How many of you who are employed love your salaries? Raise your hands. And how many of you who are business owners and entrepreneurs love your enterprise income? Raise your hands. Good. Well, then there's something over here for you. The secret sits in the middle and knows. We dance around in circles and suppose. Four lines packed with immortal wisdom. The reason why Robert Frost's poem, The Secret, resonates so strongly with me is because it's like a brilliant mirror. It reflects back to us something that we are guilty of every day, ignoring the obvious solution to problems that's sitting right under the bridge of our noses and instead running around in circles looking for exotic and esoteric solutions. And that's precisely because I believe in the power of the obvious that of all the hundreds of books sitting on my bookshelf, this little gem, 57 pages, printed in 1917, Obvious Adams, is my perennial favorite. By the way, in case you're wondering, what kind of parents would give a guy a name obvious? Okay, his parents didn't give him that name. The world did. He was a highly successful businessman, Oliver Adams. And when the world of that era, 1916, the hat makers, the cake uh, uh, makers, and the pastry makers, people in those days wore hats and ate a lot of dessert. Uh, you know, they came to him for, for solutions to their marketing and advertising problems. He would sit down, hunker down, his brow would get furrowed, he would analyze the data, and he would then come up with a recommendation. And the whole world would say, well, isn't that obvious? And he would just smile. Obvious has power, doesn't it? And that's exactly why I'm here. It is in that spirit that I'm here to share with you a very obvious secret. Do you want to hear it? Really? Without a customer, there is no business. Without a customer, there is no paycheck. Without a customer, there is no entrepreneurial income or business income. I, I know, don't hit me. And you're going to say, Gaurav, we stayed back in the afternoon to listen to you just so that you could repeat this obvious stripe to us? I'm smiling now because it is obvious. And isn't it most powerful? Can you think of a business without a customer? At least I can't. And the whole deal is, we have known this for hundreds of years, thousands of years. It's only recently that gurus like Peter Drucker, etc., have brought this into the business world when they said, the only purpose of a business is to get a customer and hang on to that customer, retain the customer. But who's listening? I mean, they get the customer, they understand, and they get that. But hang on to the customer? We live in 2018, just 10 to 12 years ago. The American car industry was sitting at the top of the mountain. America was the number one car manufacturer in the world. Detroit was on the mountain top. Where is it today? Let's listen to it in the words of one of the most respected American auto executives, Robert McDonald. The product quality, down the tubes. Innovation, don't even talk about it. But most importantly, what happened? Who did they forget? And when you forget the customer, and when you ignore their changing needs, very bad things happen. And that's what we are here to talk about. Folks, if I was not convinced that this is an area where Amer not just America, but the world needs to improve, I wouldn't be talking to you about it. And I'll give you some more reasons. First of all, good afternoon again, everybody. And because my name doesn't have a Caucasian ring to it, I'll say it again. My name's Gaurav Bhalla. I'm a local guy from Reston, Virginia, just down the street, okay, Dallas Airport. And my passion is soulful leadership. And uh, 
Cheryl, oh, Cheryl already gave it to me. It's the offspring of my book, which I gifted to her. By the way, I just got back from overseas. I don't have too many copies in hand, but if any of you would like a copy, please share your email address and your name and telephone number. Very happy to get you a copy. Uh, it's an offspring of this book, Awakening a Leader's Soul. And it is a new human-centric narrative on leadership, and it has three very important characteristics. First, it says that in the 21st century, the most important asset of a leader is not their executive brilliance, but their humanity, who they are, what they stand for, and what they're willing to fight for. The second thing it says is that let's not worry about what leaders look like. Let's forget blue eyes, blonde hair, charisma. Let's just dump all that. Let's instead focus on the leadership journeys, what leaders do. Who is benefiting from the leadership journey? Because once the leadership journey is over, what do we do? We ask the leader. We said, hey, Skip, how did we do? And if all that the leader can say is, I did all right. I don't know about you. Well, we haven't come too far from the caveman days, have we? Okay? And so the whole notion over here is increasing the well-being and prosperity for the greatest many. By the way, including the planet, which is a living, breathing entity. And not just something that we can extract and, 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 and avoid, you know, uh, by the way, this 9.20 is going the reverse direction. I have nine minutes left. Is that how it goes? Oh, okay. <laughs> I thought, man, the, the, what a clock. <laughs> okay. Uh, so th th that's my field. And I have developed three main areas of soulful leadership manifestation. And that's visionary leadership. Why? Because what's going to be required to succeed in the 21st century is very different than yesterday. We cannot make tomorrow's leaders based on yesterday's thinking. Collaboration and cognitive diversity, not demographic diversity. Cognitive diversity because the world out there is too complicated for any one individual to handle. And finally, leading with a customer-first mindset. Why? Because every single day, thousands of CEOs and companies thump their chests and say, we love our customers. But according to our friend, Lou Gerstner, who actually pulled IBM from the jaws of death with only one sentence. And he said, we will no longer ram steel down the throats of our customers. Means we are no longer in the mainframe business. We will listen to our customers, not ram steel down their throats. He says, for most people, this is a slogan. They really don't pay, they pay lip service to it. And which is why I'm speaking over here, because can you imagine what will happen if we can put an end to this? Whether it's airlines, whether it's pharmaceutical companies, whether it's bank companies, okay, the customer is being sacrificed every single day at the altar of sales and profits. So if we lead with a customer-first mindset, can you imagine the amount of well-being and prosperity we can create in this world? So how many of you would like to know how to lead with a customer-first mindset? Would you like to learn that? Okay, if I share with you just three strategies that you can implement Monday morning, not next week, not next month, not next year, but the moment you get out of this room, would that be worthwhile listening to me and having stayed back after lunch? Not that the people who came before me were not interesting. Okay, <laughs> they were very, very interesting. Uh, all right. But then there is only one Willie Jolly and there's only one Gaurav Bhalla. Right, Willie? <laughs> okay, so how do we begin by rethinking the customer? We begin by rethinking the customer. I concede to you that the customer is the source of revenues. I concede to you the customer is the source of profits, but the customer is not a wallet. If we reach for the customer's wallet first, Newton's laws of motion will set in. Every action has an equal and opposite reaction. I'm going to hang on to my wallet because I don't want to give it to you. Okay, I may not do it immediately. I may do it later on. The customer is an asset. We consume what's in our wallet. We invest in assets. So let's rethink the customer as an asset whom we invest in. Let's first win their hearts. Their wallets will follow. So let me share with you three strategies. Just three strategies. Very simple ones that will allow you to win their hearts. First. Please forget about your product and focus instead on the value that you are delivering to the customer. There's a very old saying where I come from, customers don't buy quarter inch drills, they buy quarter inch holes. Quarter inch drills that drill three quarter inch holes are no good to anybody. Okay, 
So if we are drilling quarter inch holes, then let's focus on those benefits. Let's focus on what we are actually delivering to the, 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 the uh, uh, customer. And we have three of them, functional, economic, emotional. But let's focus on the emotional. A mother with a newborn doesn't really care about the color of the bath mat. She just wants to be a champion mom who doesn't f drop her baby, whose baby doesn't get hurt while she's bathing the baby. Let's focus, let's get out of here and fulfill at least one vital emotional need. Can we all agree on that? Wonderful, okay? The second thing, service. And isn't that obvious? Barry, when was the last time you smiled when you got bad service? Now Barry might say, I don't smile anyway. You know, but you gotta smile, okay? When, you get, when we get good service, we smile. When we get bad service, we don't smile. Folks, before I go there, let me just put one myth to rest. There is no such thing as a product company. There is no such thing as a service company. Every company is a service company. In fact, the larger the product, the greater the component of service in that particular company. Can you imagine buying an airplane from Boeing and not getting a service contract? Can you imagine buying, a, if you're Musk, buying a ship and not getting a service contract? But we don't go to Staples and buy a box of Staples and say, hey, do you have an extended service contract on these box of Staples? No. Every company is a service company, but unfortunately, the cord is cut, service is broken, and the companies are saying, please don't call us. Your call is not that important to us. We don't want to speak to you. Really? Is that how we add value? Is that how we treat the, 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 the customer as an asset? So the number one mindset that we have to uh, uh, switch is, please don't look at service as a cost. It's an investment in a very valuable asset. And companies like Zappos need to be applauded because they have the courage to say powered by service. Third, Let's unleash the voice of the customer. Let's have champions in the company that can unleash the voice of the customer. This is the great Clint Eastwood, Dirty Harry, doing his empty chair routine at the 2012 Republican National Convention. By the way, Clint Eastwood has given several interviews after that, saying he was very embarrassed and ashamed. Can you imagine Dirty Harry being embarrassed and ashamed? Somebody who has never ever spoken without getting their teeth apart, all the words coming just right behind the teeth, okay? The, you know, the hatted, ponchoed, cigar chewing, guns twirling, maybe even cowboys grow up, okay? So, but he was very ashamed. But, but, but. Brian, may I borrow your chair? Thank you very much. The chair, the empty chair, does have a very important role. And I've been uh, global long before it became fashionable to talk about being global. I've been consulting, training, and speaking now since, for over 30 years. Five different continents, over 30 different countries. I just got back from, Amer from India after doing a program for the Raymond Group, which is India's Brooks Brothers, on this very theme, which I do as a keynote, as a one-day workshop, half-day workshop, two-day workshop, because the world is changing for Raymond. They were, like Book Brothers, exclusively focused on men, and then suddenly Zara comes into India and takes over the whole countryside, and all the women with it. And they're saying, what the hell are we doing? Sleeping at the wheel? Okay, so we need somebody in the company to unleash the voice of the customer, and I'm actually going to give you a very simple routine. When Dirty Harry goes to shoot a movie, he knows exactly who the director is. The director has a megaphone, the director has a chair. Why can't we have meetings in our companies where we leave an empty chair with a jacket or a shawl or a cardigan on it saying, here is where the customer sits. Can we unleash the voice of the customer in the company? Because very often companies make the biggest mistake. They assume that they know exactly how the customer feels. They knew, assume that they know exactly what the customer wants, and that actually may not be right. And that may actually hurt them, which is what hurt Detroit. After all, what is a small car? Isn't, isn't it just a 70% Xerox reduced copy of a larger car? Well, not really, okay? The, the Japanese knew that, the American car companies forgot that. Thank you very much, Brian. Okay, so let's not assume, let's test, test, test in terms of what the customer really wants. Now, ladies and gentlemen, when I am told that you only have 15 minutes, I take that very seriously. 
Though I'm going to pretend that that clock doesn't exist because it hasn't been buzzing for other people. So I sincerely hope it doesn't buzz for me. Okay? We are on the cusp of a major change. Agree? There's artificial intelligence out there. Agree? There are robots out there. Agree? There's internet of things out there. I started with a poem and I'm going to end with a poem. All this new technology will eventually give us new feelings. That will never completely displace the old ones, leaving everyone feeling quite nervous and split in two. Folks, new technologies will come. New technologies will pose uncertainties, but the customers will still be there. They will still have fears. They will still have anxieties. They will still need information. They will still need assurance. I have hundreds and thousands of customers lined up outside the door, and I need your assurance. Are you willing to lead with a customer-first mindset so that you can help these anxious people who are split in two? Are you willing to do that? Do I have your assurance? That you can unleash the voice of the customer in your companies and lead with a customer-first mindset. Is that a deal? Do we have a deal? Well, thank you very much. I'm very happy that you could stay. Thank you for paying attention. And if this aspect of soulful leadership, taking care of other people, either through visionary leadership or through cognitive diversity and collaboration or through customer-first thinking appeals to you because we're not sacrificing people at the altar of sales and profits, please talk to the Red Propeller uh, account executives and I would love to work with all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gaurav.